And we're now live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Welcome to Logical Clocks webinar on mo modern monitoring with KF Serving and the Hopsworks Future Store. To today, we have two speakers, Jim Dowling, who is the CEO of Logical Clocks, and Javier, who is a software developer in our, of our Hopsworks platform. So welcome. Thank you both so much for being here today. And just a quick few reminders that this webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive the recording and the slides after the presentation. Please use the Q&A button if you're asking questions and we do encourage you to ask questions. We'll be answering questions throughout the presentation, but at the end as well, we're gonna have a session just for Q&A. Today, Jim will present uh, the topic and then Javier will do a demo of our HopSource platform. Then I'll pass it along for you, Jim. Thanks, Natalia, and welcome to everyone, wherever you may be. So we're going to talk today about model monitoring, and we're going to talk about model serving in the Kubeflow platform, and all in the context of a feature store. So it will be quite feature store centric. Uh, my name is Jim Dowling, Javier, who is a research engineer at Logical Cox, and he's doing research in model serving, amongst other things. So I, our platform, the feature store, it is the world leading feature store. I think we have the most customers of any feature store company. It's been the uh, available the longest of any feature store. It's out over two years. It was the first open source feature store followed shortly by Feast. And we work with a lot of companies. Now we're not gonna, we're not here for marketing. So I'm just gonna tell you briefly the feature, our feature store, why is it a little bit different? Well, firstly, it's an open feature store, not just open source but you can do your data engineering in any Python or Spark platform. So you can do it in Databricks, in EMR. If you're Spark or HD Insight, you can do it in SageMaker or your Jupyter Notebook for feature engineering with Python. And you can even take tables defined in Snowflake or any external data warehouse and mount them as external tables into the feature store. So that's how you get your data in. You can plug it into any data science platform to create training data and that training data will be used to train models. And those models, some of them will be analytical and some of them will be served online, operational models that run 24 seven. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So for models that are being run 24 seven or so-called operational models, there are many model serving frameworks out there. Everything from Selden and Kubeflow model serving, uh, they're both open source to uh, the, the, the cloud providers have their own frameworks like SageMaker and AML. Uh, model serving uh, services. So those services will use the feature store to retrieve features to build what we call feature vectors. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the motivation for that in a second. And then finally, you may want to have a regulatory and compliance framework, a metadata framework like Informatica because of a relation to govern all of this data as it flows through the AI lifecycle. <clears throat> now I'm gonna start by motivating, why do we need a feature store with model serving? And this is kind of really for data scientists. So if you're not a data scientist, bear with me. Hopefully you'll learn a little bit. So the jellyfish here reminds me a little bit about deep learning. Deep learning in the sense that we have very rich sensory input, maybe images or text, and we can train some behavior to generate very complex intelligent behavior. So the jellyfish is similar. It has rich sensory input through its tentacles and it can go and munch and move and mate. Uh, and it can even be stacked in layers, just like deep learning. This one's a joke, uh, but it is true. This is a, a, a correct, this is an image of a jellyfish in case you're curious. And uh, the jellyfish has no brain. And many people claim deep learning has no brain at some level. What they mean is basically that it, it, deep learning is not strong AI. It's not able to remember its past and, and reason and plan about its future. And the jellyfish is similar. It doesn't have a brain. There's no memory of the past. Um, it's not able to plan it at the future, it just reacts to whatever the rich sensory input it gets. Now that's kind of interesting as a kind of a story, but what has that got to do with model serving? Well, if we imagine deep learning as serving, uh, let's say an image classifier, well, we're gonna train the images, but before we train uh, our deep learning model or convolutional neural network model on, on some images, we need to do some feature engineering. We might need to resize the images, crop them or something like that. So. One of the problems we have uh, with uh, that feature stores address is this problem what we call training serving skew. That if we don't perform the same feature engineering when we're 
training, so the, the code here the crop, that crops and resizes the image, that's the feature engineering. If we don't do the same code when we're serving, we'll get skew. We won't be able to make good predictions because the actual input data won't be exactly the same because the feature engineering code is slightly different. So you can solve that problem quite easily by having versions of the libraries that perform the feature engineering. So in this case, if I have images coming in in a live system, I can use the same version of the library that is used to crop and resize the images when I generate these images for training. And this will work fine. And this is great. I have a very complex model. I can even build self-driving cars out of this, as Tesla do. So uh, you can do the same with, with text. So natural language processing, we can train um, you know, uh, a translation system based on, on just tokenized text uh, as input. And then we can pass in some new text in a new language and it will translate. This seems like a very rich system. And the input signals are very rich here. So that's all the data we, we need. Now, however, if you're working in the enterprise realm, a lot of your data is not text or image. You're gonna have a lot of what we call tabular data. So if I'm building a recommender system and I have somebody on a website, and I want to recommend some, something to that user, maybe it's a shop or maybe it's just an action for them to take. Well, when the user browses around, we'll generate lots of actions that they're taking and they'll have the user identity, but the application may, may have very, may, very much more state available to it. So we can featureize these actions, but the actions by themselves don't have enough rich enough input. It's not a rich input like an image or, or, or a piece of text. It's just user click this button, user, entered some text in the text box. You only get useless models with that information. So it doesn't matter if you have consistent feature engineering between serving and training if you don't have any good features to begin with. This is where the feature store comes in. When you have tabular uh, data and you want to train models and you want to use in particular historical features, contextual features, they're not available in the app. So we have a stateless app we can see here. So the app is going to take in user IDs, product IDs, maybe the action the user takes, but we want to get the history of the user's interaction with not just this app, but maybe with the entire enterprise. How many items has the user bought in the last month? How frequent a visitor are they? Are they a high value visitor? What product do they have? What are the, in, the features about the product that they're currently uh, viewing or they have in their shopping cart? Where do we get all this state? Well, we get it from the feature store. And how we get it from the feature store is we do need to have feature engineering to put features in the feature store. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but basically training data involves then taking features from the feature store and creating training data set. We join the features, we reuse features to create training data. And we've got training data, we can train them into a model. And then when we have an application, we can retrieve these features from the model, the pre-computed features. You know, uh, Is this a high value customer? What about the features of this product? Can we put them all in the feature store and then the stateless application or the model itself can retrieve these features, build the feature vector with all of the rich features in it now and make predictions. So that's the basic motivation for uh, the online feature store and why we need it with model serving. It gives our model serving application a brain. Our jellyfish now becomes more like an octopus. And unless you're, you, you don't know much about octopuses, they're super smart. There was one in New Zealand that uh, took a dislike to one of the staff where it lived and squirted water at it every time that person went by. So they have very good memory. Okay, what we're gonna talk a little bit about today in particular are, is open source. Everything's open source. We've got Kubeflow model serving, which is an open source model serving framework and the Hopsworks feature store, which is open source. And we're going to look at this pre-computed features with history and context. We're going to retrieve features and Javi will do a demo for about 20 minutes at the end, going through um, how we add data to the feature store, how we have an AI enabled product that looks up features, how we can retrieve these features uh, from the feature store. It's going to do that in the model serving infrastructure in, in Kubeflow model serving. I'm just going to close this here. And uh, then he's also going to, we're also going to extend this. We're going to log the prediction requests from Kubeflow serving to Kafka and then uh, do model monitoring. So error drift detection and, and so on. Okay. Now Hopsworks uh, is a modular open platform. You can plug it into any Spark or, or, or Python environment, as I mentioned. Um, but you can also do those things on our platform itself. You can do feature engineering on our platform. You can train models. You can develop models with Jupyter notebooks that are part of the platform. There's a PyCharm plugin. There's support for GitHub and GitLab. 
and there's a model repository in there and then we have kubeflow model serving comes with the enterprise platform um, and underneath this it's underpinned data stored in s3 and we have our own metadata database called rondb so what is kf serving i've mentioned it a couple of times it's an open source model serving framework it supports many different uh, frameworks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, um, NVIDIA's TensorRT and XGBoost, ONNX. And uh, basically Kubeflow model serving is a part of the Kubeflow framework. It's a framework for machine learning on Kubernetes. And it builds on top of some technologies, Knative, which is serverless uh, computing on Kubernetes, and then Istio, which is for secure networking um, within Kubernetes cluster. And then we have Kubernetes itself that manages resources such as GPUs and CPUs. And we're not gonna go into what Kubernetes is <laughs> in too much detail. Okay, I clicked on the wrong link there. So let's go back. Okay. Now, um, what does Kubeflow model serving with a feature store look like in terms of code? Well, we have our AI enabled application. And one way you can do it is you can, in, like the diagram I showed earlier, our AI-enabled ap application or product, it can build these feature vectors if we want. So we can see number one here, the AI-enabled application can go to the feature store and say, hey, I would like to retrieve my feature vector. And you can see we have some sample code from our platform here. In fact, um, each model that we train can use something called a training data set that I'll introduce in the platform. So that train data set tells us all the features that the model used uh, were used to train the model so with that TD object, we can say, here's um, the ID of the, the, the feature vector. So in this case, it's the, the training data had a, a primary key, which was a, a car credit card number. And we can pass in this credit card number and say, please give me back the feature vector um, for this model uh, with this credit card number. So it might be, for example, uh, the number of transactions that have happened in a period of time, like an hour, uh, it might be the average amount of money spent on the on that credit card within that time period. And you may have multiple time periods there. So then be maybe useful features to help predict fraud, for example, on the credit card. And uh, once you have the feature vector, then you can make the prediction request directly on the model that will be hosted in Kubeflow model serving. So you can see the steps here. You re request the features, return the uh, enriched feature vector, make a prediction request, and uh, send it to the model and get the result back. And the result is the prediction. In this case, it might be fraud or not fraud. So you can do it in your application, but you might like to have good software engineering practices and keep your application even leaner. Um, so we have a, a stateless application that's just going to send the credit card number, uh, in this case, number one, to Kubeflow model serving. And in Kubeflow model serving, we have an intermediate um, piece of code that can be executed before the model is actually, uh, before the, the, the prediction is made on the model. And this is called the transformer. So in fact, what you can do is when the transformer starts up, it can talk to the feature store and get back this training data set object. And then when the prediction request comes in in this pre-process step, we can say, hey, go to the feature store again, get back this feature vector with all the features we need. And uh, then it will send that further onto the model to make a prediction. And then the AI enabled product gets its results back here. So that's kind of the, the higher level picture of how it works. I'm going to go into a bit more details in the APIs, but just first a little bit more about Kubeflow model serving. It has many capabilities. It's pretty much the de facto open source model serving framework at this point. What we're talking about here now is integrating this online feature store with the transformer. But there are other uh, features such as you can have canary endpoints for A-B testing models. So before you deploy a model to all of the clients, you can deploy it to a subset, maybe 5% or 10%. And there's also an explainer component that you can plug in to help generate explanations of the predictions that have been made. And there is now support, we've added support for a logger. So it's a side current Kubernetes that will log the prediction requests to Kafka. And then there's other support for having multiple models inside pods, multi-model serving, uh, and a bunch of other lower level features. So how does this fit into the whole end-to-end -end pipeline? The end-to-end -end pipeline is where we have our raw input data and we go and create features, store them in the feature store, train and validate models, and then we go to this model serving and monitoring stage that we're talking about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk our way through this and Javier will have a, a demo that goes through a lot of this in detail. Again, please ask questions with the Q&A 
if uh, you have any questions at this point and Javier shall endeavor to answer them. Um, but I'm going to just go through some of the abstractions that we have in our platform that, that make it a little bit unique. So firstly, we, we represent features as what we call feature groups. So when we bring data into the feature store from external sources, and the data can come from anywhere, it can come from files, it can come from data warehouses, Kafka, um, you have many different sources. And if it's a Spark program, Spark has connectors to every conceivable source. Um, if it's a Python application using to compute your features, again, there are connectors to every conceivable input source. These feature groups may also be external tables, so they could be uh, coming from a, a database like Snowflake. So we can write snow there. Um, and they all look the same effectively, when, at least when we're creating training data. So offline feature groups, we call those. So in this case, we can see we've got two features coming into a feature group called transactions feature group. So these are financial transactions. We've got the type of transaction, maybe it's a money transfer, and then the amount of money transferred. And we also have the user ID who performed the transfer. And then we have different uh, features related to the user, the, their nationality and gender. Um, maybe not all of these features should be used in models. As you may know, you may in, introduce bias into your models. So you need to always be careful for that. So in this case, we have, um, we can see that we have another abstraction after the feature groups. And the feature groups are the reusable features and they can come from source data. You can have derived feature groups that are computed just by, from other features in the feature store. But the training data set is something I think unique to our platform uh, as an abstraction. It's part of the feature store in the sense that we store the metadata for it, but um, you can save your training data set itself in any external file system or object store. So you can say, create this training data set in your bucket in S3, and then go train your model in SageMaker. Um, and the same goes for Azure Blob Storage. So um, the training data set is, is a representation of the model because what we're doing is we're taking features and we might take feature values within a given time range as well. And we're gonna join them together. So joining means basically reusing features. If we, we're not joining them, we're not reusing them. That's something we, we say internally. So we're basically gonna take a bunch of features, join them together, and then decide what file format we want. Is it going to be CSV, which is a popular file format for scikit-learn or TF record for TensorFlow? And this training data set, we can train the model with. And when we create the training data set in our platform, we actually store descriptive statistics, uh, feature we, generate, we can generate feature correlation matrices and compute histograms of distributions of feature values, which are kind of nice for exploratory data analysis. But they're also useful. They're very useful for drift detection when we're doing model serving. And we'll see this later on. You can use a Python API to the feature store to say, get me the mean value of this feature in this training data set. Get me its standard deviation. And once you know that and you're doing model monitoring, you can, you can monitor and measure the, the live traffic and the live value of feature, uh, of, of live feature values and compute the mean value, compute the standard deviation over a period of time, like an hour. And if it's statistically significantly different from the training data, the mean and standard deviation, then you might want to decide that that, that drift has happened and, and then you'll take some action to, um, to handle that. Okay. So quick uh, introduction to abstractions. We have the feature group. It's effectively a table with a primary key. And the primary, you can have more than one primary key, we call it a multi-part primary key. And this is stored for both uh, creating training data, and this is what we call the offline feature store. And then for, for the live model serving, we call that the online feature store. It's a different database, a low latency database called RONDB. And we've said this already, but um, training data sets are basically created by selecting features from different feature groups and then saying, join these together. And uh, there has to be a common primary key between them, at least one, it could be a day, so it could be a user ID or, or some other ID, and you can have more than one. Um, and then the train data set will have a label as well because we're doing supervised machine learning. So one of your columns you can designate as the label. When you're uh, in your application and your application might have something like the user ID, and we want to look up, well, you know, how many times has the user visited this website? 
which is one feature in the last hour. And then another one is uh, maybe how many times have they bought items from us in the last month? That's feature N. But we can use the user ID to look up those values. They're just the latest values of the feature. Of course, the, the label column won't be in the online feature store because that's what we're going to predict. So this is what we call the feature vector that I've mentioned already. It's effectively the ID for the rows and then uh, the, representing the training data set. And then we have the other features within the training data set. Now, how do we get these features into the feature store? And I'm going to go a little bit of code now, look, look through some API examples. Well, we can write programs that will up, keep the features refreshed. They'll run periodically, maybe every hour, every month, or every, it might be a streaming application writing every 10 seconds. And some of these feature groups will be from external tables. So that means from external databases, and some of them will be cached or stored in our feature store. And in this case, if they're cached in our feature store, they're stored as hoodie, which is a file format that runs on, it's, it's Parquet plus metadata, Parquet files with metadata, and it's stored in an S3 bucket if you're running on our managed platform on AWS or Azure. So we're gonna have these programs and they're gonna be written in Python or, or Spark. And uh, they're gonna write, or they're gonna run this part, which is what we call the feature pipeline. And the feature pipeline, you, you also would like to automate this. So you should have some form of orchestrator. Our platform supports Airflow, but you can use pretty much any orchestrator you like, whether it's Azure Data Factory or GitHub Actions. And the actions that you, you when you want to run these feature pipelines is, if new data arrives potentially uh, on a schedule like daily or every hour, or even if code is being pushed, um, you might want to kick off a feature pipeline being run. The other pipeline that we typically have in this uh, that I'm not gonna go through today is training pipelines. And again, we can, have, we can, we can um, automate the training pipelines to handle, for example, when new commits happen to feature groups, we can create new train data sets and then train new models and then validate and deploy those models. And there is a model registry in the platform for that. So um, another thing that we're going to cover uh, in, in the example is, mo is model monitoring. So when the model is being served in uh, Kubeflow model serving, as I mentioned already, we can log the prediction requests to Kafka. And then from there, we can have a, an application read those prediction requests or inference requests they're called here. And it can then compute, you, uh, well, basically perform some computations on the live traffic to compute, uh, for example, descriptive statistics over different time windows. So you know, what's the average value of this feature over the last 10 minutes? And then compare it with the training data statistics to see if we have drift or outliers and then write any information about outliers or drift to uh, our feature store. You can call it an evaluation store if you want, but we call it uh, a, just a part of the feature store. So I'm gonna go through the API and have you, we'll go through these examples in some detail. Um, you'll have some notebooks. The notebooks are available online. There is this documentation uh, site, docs.hopsworks.ai. You'll find a lot more details and there are example notebooks there as well. But I'm gonna start by um, writing data to the feature store. So th this code can be run, this is Python code or it can be run in PySpark or Python. Um, we, we use the term writing to the feature store rather than ingesting because in a Spark application, you do write directly. There's no write amplification. We're not writing to some uh, secondary storage and then you need to run an ingestion pipeline afterwards. You're just writing directly to the feature store. But what you're doing is you're getting a metadata object called FG meta. And this object is a feature group. And the feature group has a name. It also has a schema version. So. The schema version basically means what are the, the set of columns and their types. And if I, if I have a, an MLOps setup, let's say I have a, a training pipeline that runs every day because there's new training data arrives every day, new data arrives in the feature groups. And these feature groups are mutable. They can be updated all the time to keep your features fresh. You're, you're writing to them as often as the, as the data needs to be refreshed. Um, but if you have a training pipeline that's it's built on version one, then that training pipeline can keep running every day and it can train a new model and off you go. But if you want to add new features or drop new features from this feature group, you want to change it because it evolves over time. Well, what needs to happen then is that you want to be able to rely that version one should keep running because that's, that's MLOps, it should just keep working. 
Um, but and it, data scientists can go ahead and create version two and not affect any production pipelines, but they can um, uh, change the, the set of features that are made up in this feature group and train new models on version two. And if everything is good, you can then switch over your pipelines from version one to version two. So a couple of things that happens here. And in this case, we're gonna store the data both online and offline. So we will need, uh, and these are happening internally on our platform. We're gonna set up the storage on the bucket in S3 or Azure um, Blob Storage. There will be some metadata under the platform. And um, because we're gonna be able to write to the online feature store, we're gonna use a Kafka topic uh, as, a, as a intermediate ingestion step. So when we're writing to this feature group, what we can do is we can basically get a reference to it. And you can see this reference here is the name of the feature group and its version number. And then we can insert a, a data frame. So this can be any Python or Spark uh, data frame. And you can, if you want, optionally only ingest to the online feature store. So you don't have to write to both online and offline. The feature group object itself has the metadata. It knows, should I go online? Should I go offline? Or should I go both or just one? But you can override it if you want here at this point. Now I see there's a couple of questions and maybe Javi is answering them, but we, I'll just take them here. So will you post the recording? Yes. Does the feature store uh, hold all the source data or just the metadata associated with all features? Okay, that's um, from Corinthian. So uh, I, as I said earlier, so you can have feature groups that are external tables and that means that there's only metadata or you can have cached feature groups. And that's what I'm doing here. This is a cached feature group. So it will actually store the data and that data will be stored like I said, in a bucket in S3 for the offline store and in the online store in our database RonDB. Now the feature groups are a little bit um, more sophisticated than this. What we can do is we can also apply validation rules as data is written to the feature group. So every time we do an insert or upsert into this feature group, what will happen is that we'll execute these expectations. Right? So the first rule is that the minimum value will be zero and I'll generate a warning if, if there's a value uh, of the feature. Uh, in this case, the feature is not defined here, but we, we do need to actually give it a, a, fe a feature name that we're attaching the specific. So it should be in this expectation here with the feature name as well. So um, in this case, we imagine something like the amount of money that's going in. And if it's less than zero, we'll get a warning. If it's greater than a million, we'll get an error. An error means that, that the data will not be ingested. So, um, in this case, we do have asset updates with Hoodie. So whenever we write to the feature group, either all of the values will be written or none. So that you, won't be, you won't be kept if you get an error with half of your data written and half of it not written. So you, these expectations we can attach to these feature groups. And then every time we perform an insert, we'll, we'll execute these data validation rules. And underneath the covers, this is using a library called DQ, if you're curious. So we can also write directly, uh, we, we can do feature engineering in streaming applications like Spark Streaming. I think we're the only feature store that supports this currently to do um, very low latency feature engineering where you can have a data frame that you're computing and I'll show a more complex example on the next slide. But basically you're just calling insert stream. Um, so you're inserting this uh, data frame that you're computing in Spark Streaming to the online feature store. Um, directly. So let's have a look at that example. Uh, this is the architecture before we show the, the actual code. So the architecture is that what will happen in, when you're running a streaming app is that it will, um, we'll have created, uh, when we created the feature group, we'll have created the, the topic in Kafka and our streaming app will write to this uh, topic in Kafka. And then we have a service running in the background called OnlineFS, which makes the updates to the online feature store here. So, and this all happens transparently and we did have a blog last week about it. If you're curious, where with two virtual machines with just eight CPUs each, I think we were getting over a million reads per second uh, from, from the outside and writes, I think we had, a, uh, I can't remember, a couple of hundred thousand writes per second. But you can look it up. And the end-to-end -end latency was less than a second. Uh, the latency measured here was, I think was maximum 400 milliseconds and then um, this one, or sorry, it was 400 milliseconds from end to end, from here to here. Um, and that was with a thousand, a batch size of a thousand. Uh, and then each update was I think a hundred features, but you can read the details yourself in the blog. So um, this is the more complex uh, Spark streaming or structured streaming example. 
here we're, we're connecting to Kafka to read some source data and then we're uh, deserializing it. So we're adding the, the schema to that, to that event that we've read. And then we compute something called a window. And the window is, is we want to know in the last 10 minutes, you know, what's the average amount of money spent on this transaction? So the, sorry, this credit card, we've got a credit card number. We want to know the average amount of money spent on it. And we could have another feature, which is, you know, the number of transactions as well. And, and we can add more and more. And so you can see the code is very straightforward. We're just doing a group by and an aggregation with an average uh, operation. And this window 10 minute signal data frame, we just insert into the uh, feature group object, and then it will add it, it will run it through that architecture we saw on the last slide. It'll push it all the way to the online feature store. Now you may ask, where do I uh, perform uh, transformations, aggregations and validations? Yeah, I do that before the feature store, but sometimes I wanna perform tra transformations after the feature store, when I'm creating training data, when I'm serving, and I want those to be consistent. We want no skew between training and serving. So we have support coming in now, it's in 2.3 of Opsworks, where we can define what we call transformation functions. So online transformation functions. You can define a function in Python um, and as an input as a single feature, and then it returns the transformed feature value. So in this example, it's transforming a string into a timestamp, uh, an integer timestamp, integer representation with timestamp. And you put these functions inside a Python module is what you do. So you need to basically, you can upload them as files or put them in GitHub and they're all fine. Now, with this transformation function, we can create a training data set that will apply these transformations when the training data set is being created. So here we can see we have this transformation function here is the one that we saw. It's going to transform a string to a timestamp and that's the object representing it. And then what we need to do is we need to create a training data set. So in this example, we're taking features from the sales feature group, we're selecting all of them, and we're joining them with two features from a, a feature group called the exogenous feature group. I haven't introduced it, but you can just assume it has features called fuel price and consumer price index. So now I have a query object that has all of the features from my sales feature group, and I've added two extra features to it. So this is the, this is the data I'm gonna train my model on, this query object. And I'm gonna save the query object inside this training data object that I create here. And the training data object basically says, here's the name of my training data set, a description, the file format will be TF record, and please apply this transformation function called a date string to timestamp on the feature called sale TS. And we can have a list of these. We're not restricted to one, of course, we can have as many transformation functions as we have features here. And what we'll see is that this same transformation function, it's a Python function, will be applied consistently in serving. So um, how it works in serving is that we, we have this training data set object. And in this case, the training data set object is called AML. And all we need to do is basically, basically supply the primary key. And in this case, I'm just supplying the primary key is the date. And here's the value for the date. That's a timestamp. And what happens is the implementation of this method, and this is uh, a, a, again, in the HSFS API, and, and this is Python code now running in our serving infrastructure. So we would be running this in Kubeflow model serving. Um, th this will apply the, the transformation functions before it returns this Python array here. So it happens transparently to the programmer. You don't even need to see, um, but behind the scenes it's transforming the, the features that were read from the online feature store before they're returned to the client. These are all, this is all done on the client in the HSFS API. So I'm not gonna go through this diagram in detail, but Javier is gonna do a demo. And I can just give you the broad sweep of what he's going to do in the demo. Um, so I've talked a little bit about, you know, we have Kubeflow model serving here. We have our online feature store here. We have the offline feature store. And I've talked about, you know, how we write to the feature store, how we create training data sets, how we read from the feature store. So there's quite a lot, a lot of um, things going on in this, uh, in this diagram. I'll, I'll try and start from the top. So we have um, feature data, the original feature data, the credit card activity arriving in a Kafka topic. And that's quite common that you know, every event when you, you do something on a web page or whenever you pay something that that data ends up in a platform like Kafka or Kinesis. And from there, we have our Spark streaming application that's gonna read these credit card events and compute the features. 
it's going to store those features in the in both you can do in both offline and online um, i think mostly here we're doing it in, in the online feature store so once those features are there and uh, an ai enabled application wants to enter a credit card number to see if we have fraud or not kubeflow model serving will go to the feature store and retrieve the feature vector so these counts of events in the credit card and, and the amount of money spent in the last 10 minutes and so on. And then it will build up the feature vector and it'll make the prediction and it will send back a response as to whether it's fraud or not. Um, there, we do need to, to, in order to do this, we need to get some model artifacts. We need to get the model itself that was trained and, um, and we're gonna write the prediction logs to Kafka and then um, Javier will talk as well about how we do a monitoring application that takes those prediction logs, uses the statistics from the training data set to compute drift and outliers on the model that's running in production. So you can see it's quite complex and there's quite a number of steps involved, but we'll try and break it down as, as best as we can. If you're curious about the details of the um, model monitoring application, this is an open source Spark streaming application written in Scala and that, that Javier uses and he, he configures to, uh, to basically do model monitoring for pretty much any model, because what it does is it knows about the schema for the training data set, and it knows about the set of features. And then when you're configuring, you can basically decide which features to compute which of these uh, different windows uh, for or statistics for. Okay, with that, I'm gonna hand over to Javier and um, he's gonna take the demo. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll see if there's any questions right. for a while. While he's doing that, I'll try and type them in the screen. So I can answer questions while Javier is talking and I'll mute myself. Thanks. Right. Um, I think you're seeing now the screen. I hope so. Yeah. So, okay, let's see. Uh, let's have a look at the notebooks for this demo for the use case that Jim just uh, presented. So, um, let's start with the creation of the feature groups. Uh, first, for this uh, demo, we will have uh, four feature groups. The first one uh, will contain the, the credit, trans, uh, credit card transactions, and the other three will contain the aggregations of the uh, statistics uh, of these transactions at different uh, uh, rates like 10 minutes, one hour, and 12 hours. First of all, I will run these cells to create the, the different feature groups. Um, we define here uh, the schema of the uh, that the feature groups will contain, and then, as GM uh, explained before, we will use HSFS. The um, a Python library, library to connect to the feature store API and then create the feature store group a metadata object in which we can specify the version if we want it uh, online as well or not. In our case, we will only use uh, in an online manner uh, the three last feature groups, the ones containing the aggregations uh, for the uh, 10 minutes, one hour and 12 hours. So once the feature groups have already been created, we can proceed with the next notebook. In this notebook, we will simulate the um, uh, generation of the uh, financial transactions on how the AI-enabled platform will send them to uh, the Kafka topic. So these transactions uh, are generated just in Faker, which is a, a library in Python uh, to generate synthetic data. We can start already running all of this. We don't need to go uh, into detail in the st structure of the financial transactions, but we can just uh, see an example of how they look like. We have the transaction ID, uh, the date time of the transaction, the credit card that was involved and the amount of money being transferred and if it's fraud or not in this case. After that, we can uh, start sending these financial transactions uh, to Kafka. We can see here, and in the meantime, we can proceed with the uh, next notebook. 
here we will see how to create uh, the streaming queries to ingest uh, this uh, to compute the feature engineering compute the aggregations basically yeah, at different rates on the uh, on the financial transaction that we are sending to Kafka and then uh, write them to the online feature store so in this case let's we will start running all of these cells first uh, let's check yeah this one's already finished so all the uh, valid financial transactions are already sent to, to Kafka. So we can proceed running the ingestion pipelines. Basically what we do here is to define the same structure of the transactions and create uh, a streaming query uh, on actually three streaming queries in a Spark that will compute the aggregations as you uh, saw before in the previous slides. And then we can use these streaming queries to um, ingest the data using HSFS again. In retrieving the feature group metadata objects, we can call insert the stream and pass different streaming queries. We can see here, once we do that, we can uh, check the status of these streaming queries and if they are active or not, or not we can see that they are already processing processing, uh, processing new data and new data is available. So uh, in the meantime, let's wait a little bit until uh, all the data is ingested. We can proceed with the next one. I can start explaining this one, in which uh, basically we will use the uh, these uh, aggregations to train an autoencoder in this case, move this here. I will start uh, the Spark application now. So as I said, uh, we will train an autoencoder here that will learn uh, the patterns of uh, valid uh, credit card activities and try to, uh, basically what it does is, is compose of an encoder and a, and a decoder. So the encoder will uh, create uh, an embeddings of this uh, activity and then the decoder will reconstruct uh, the activity. So by doing that, we can uh, later on check if the loss between the reconstruction and the original values is over a threshold. We can consider this to be a fraud. Let's check if how is the, okay. The data is already in the online feature store. It's already waiting for more data. We can have a look here on the online feature store, the data that we have, and we can um, now use a hoodie to uh, grade this data to the offline feature store. And uh, this data in the offline feature store, uh, is the, the one that will be used to uh, create, to generate the training data sets, as I will show uh, in, a, in a second. So we can start here. This is streaming queries using Hoodie. It's already great, uh, processing the, the data. Okay, let's go back to the training data set here. Uh, for training the model, uh, we will uh, create a transformation function the one that uh, Jim saw before, we can attach uh, this transformation fun function uh, to the offline, uh, sorry, to the feature store. So by doing this, we can reduce the transformation function at different points in the, in the pipelines. So for example, when we create the training data set, we can apply uh, tra specific transformations to specific features. And also we can reuse these transformations uh, at uh, prediction time to, to avoid the training serving skew problem and ensure that the, the values uh, used for making predictions are uh, in the same type or shape, uh, per se, uh, than the, the data used for the uh, generating the models. So once we are here, we can retrieve the feature uh, group metadata objects again. Let's see how is the process. 
All right, no new data. So the offline feature store already contains the, the data. We can uh, start specifying the, the query that we want to use to join uh, the features from the different uh, feature groups and create the training data set. We will run this as well. So when we create the training data set, basically uh, we create the metadata object and we can specify in which format we want to store the data, in this case, the record, records. And here uh, in the transformation functions parameter, we can uh, assign a dictionary in which we specify which transformation functions we want to apply to which uh, features. And also we can uh, specify if we want to compute the statistics on these features. Uh, for this demo, we need to compute uh, descriptive, descriptive statistics and also the distributions in order to uh, later on, when we, when we collect the operation logs, uh, we can uh, match these uh, statistics with the, the statistics of the operation logs and try to um, find outliers and also detailed uh, drift of this data. So while the training data set is being generated, let's go to the model training. Again, okay. Uh, so um, here, uh, as I mentioned before, we are going to uh, train uh, an autoencoder. Um, this autoencoder will uh, learn the, the patterns in the activity of the credit cards and then try to um, predict if it's fraud or not based on the loss in the reconstruction. For that, um, the training data set is already here, right? So we can start uh, creating uh, an experiment to train the model. As we can see here, here we define the, the autoencoder and here what we are doing is to compute the, the reconstruction loss uh, in a model that acts as a grapper on the, in the model. So then when we, uh, in TensorFlow, we save the, the model, we, when we export the model uh, to the local uh, file system, we can, we can add new uh, signatures, like for example, reconstructing with we perform an extra step, which is uh, computing the, the uh, mean square error between the reconstruction and the original values. So while the experiment is uh, running, we can have a look at the next uh, notebook. In this notebook, we will uh, serve the model that we are training. And uh, we will also, uh, when we serve this model, we will create an artifact that contains the model files and also contains uh, a transformer file. This transformer file looks like this, which can be a Python script and also a Jupyter notebook. If it's a Jupyter notebook, then you can also in the same notebook uh, test your transformer by instantiating uh, an object of the transformer and uh, just testing uh, some values, calling the preprocess function and so on. So it looks like this, as uh, Jim introduced before, where we can uh, create a connection to the feature store in the initialization method that only runs once when the transformer uh, starts. And then uh, we can uh, retrieve the serving vectors using the credit card numbers and create the enriched uh, request inputs uh, that will be used later on to make uh, predictions. And also in the same way, we could also uh, apply some uh, post-processing tasks to the predictions that will come back uh, from the model here. But in this case, we don't need to do that. The experiment has finished already. So we can start uh, serving the model. Here we can uh, use Hops, which is a library, Python library, to interact with the Hops course uh, API, REST API. So we can check which are the best model uh, based on the, for example, if we uh, create, if we launch uh, different experiments, we can 
uh, check which uh, model version has the, the best accuracy or uh, less loss and so on. So then we pick a model version that we want to serve and we can use the serving module to create, first let me start running here, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, one second. It says that it's not created. I think I committed, uh, there is a typo somewhere. Let's see if we can create another one. Just in a moment. So we can create a New, let's say we can create in the UI uh, new Kafka topics in which we can specify the inference schema and different versions. For KF serving deployments, we have to use the version four. And once this topic has been created, we can just copy paste it here. Um, yeah, there was a typo in the name. Or, no, there is now a typo here. Sorry. This is not the model that we want to serve. Okay, let's change directly around the name. And that's it. We'll deploy a second model. Doesn't matter. So when we create the serving, no, again, no. It's, okay, it's not being detected. There is something that I'm doing wrong here. But okay, let's continue. Let's try to continue with the, since we have eight minutes left, I have some backups here from the previous uh, time that I was running this notebook. So this is what it should look like. There might be a typo in the name somewhere but we don't have time to fix it. So um, yeah, when we create the, the model, uh, we can uh, specify a serving name, uh, the model path where our uh, model files are located, a version uh, that we want to create a, an artifact, uh, serving this model with KF serving. Also, we can specify the, the path to the transformer script and the, the topic where we want to send the prediction logs. Uh, using the same tool, we can just start the, the serving and then uh, we can uh, use HSFS to just uh, generate some sample credit card numbers. Uh, there has to be valid ones that are still, that are already uh, known, like uh, that are already, for example, in the feature store. And then we can use these uh, credit card numbers to uh, make inferences. Uh, to the model to predict if the recent, the most recent activity, which is the one uh, stored in the online feature store is fraud or not. So here we have some examples of that. So when we start running uh, predictions, we can go back to the uh, produce transaction notebook and we can start uh, simulating new fraudulent uh, we, we can start generated fraudulent uh, financial transactions and start uh, sending them to Kafka. So in this uh, right now, what we are doing is simulating that uh, some uh, fraud is being uh, produced in, in the platform. So as we can see here, and this will be represented uh, in the, um, when we ingest uh, this data, the, the new recent activity of the credit cards will show uh, anomalous uh, patterns that will be detected by the model and the loss, the reconstruction loss uh, will be higher. When we uh, create these new transactions that are fraudulent in this case, we can come back to the previous streaming queries that I didn't stop yet. And we can see that it's uh, still running and processing new data. So this is uh, continuously running. And additionally, we can go to jobs, create 
new monitoring job here. Which we have already uh, compiled a version of this job. And we have in the demo examples that you can find in the GitHub repository. We can uh, specify here, we have to specify here the name of the main class to run. Uh, you can see here. And then as a conf uh, parameter, we can uh, add the name of the JSON file where we have the configuration for this job. This JSON file has to be added to the deployment and is also included in the, the demo files. So after that, we can start creating, uh, we can uh, create the job. And if we have a look at this uh, configuration file, we can see that it contains information about the model and also the schema of the request and the predictions and uh, um, configuration about how we want to compute the statistics, detect outliers and data drift. So we can see that we can specify the duration of the window, the slide, uh, that we want to compute the standard deviation, uh, covariance, correlation between features, and also uh, outliers in three uh, different ways. If values are more than the maximum, less than the minimum, or farther than three standard deviations from the mean, we can consider them. Uh, we will consider them as outliers. And also we want to compute drift uh, using uh, three different distance uh, metrics, which are Wasserstein, Kulva Cleaver, and Jensen Sanon. We can specify thresholds that uh, if the value computed is over this threshold, we can uh, we will consider that this data has already drifted. And we can also specify uh, the baseline statistics here, which can be retrieved from uh, using the uh, using HSFS, as we can see here. We created the training data set in the previous cell. And here we can uh, reuse HSFS to get the statistics of this training data set and also specific, uh, of a specific version of the training data set. And additionally, we can uh, specify from which topic we want to read uh, the prediction logs and where we want to store the statistics, the outliers, and the drift. In this case, the statistics will go to uh, as target files to this uh, directory, and the outliers and drift will be sent to these different uh, Kafka topics. So mm -hmm, let's go back here. Okay, this is the one. So after running the job and uh, making some predictions and also changing, uh, simulating the fraudulent uh, transactions, we can uh, start, sorry, let me go back here. Yeah, we can uh, move to the inference analysis notebook in which uh, we will uh, read these target files and we can uh, print the different descriptive statistics that are computed in uh, windowed basis. We can see the feature, mean, maximum of each feature in these uh, windows, also the distribution of these um, features and the correlation between them, the covariance uh, between them. And additionally, we can uh, consume the Kafka topics that we specify in the configuration uh, file. And we can see uh, the, that at this uh, point in time, uh, we detected uh, an outlier of this feature with this value and the reason why we consider this is uh, an outlier. And the same, uh, it works for uh, drift detection. We can see uh, in which uh, window the data contained in, in which specific window which con which, uh, was considered uh, to have drifted uh, using which uh, algorithm and which value was obtained uh, after applying uh, this algorithm. And also, uh, again, uh, the detection time where we detected the, 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 the drift in the data. So using the, um, these insights, 
of outliers and drift detected in the prediction logs, as well as uh, since we are sending also these prediction logs to the, uh, we can send these prediction logs to the, to the offline feature store, we can, for example, use Airflow to automate the, um, to trigger, uh, uh, to trigger the execution of the uh, different notebooks, for example, uh, performing more feature engineering, uh, different uh, kind of feature engineering on the on these feature values, or um, uh, perform some uh, feature selection, or generate a new training data set and train a new uh, version of the model, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Uh, almost everything that I wanted to show. Also, uh, just take into account that the the same actions that I took in the in the notebooks, we can perform them in the UI. We can go to model serving and deploy uh, a model here. We can specify the transfer where we have the transformer file, uh, which topic, which kind of uh, data we want to log into the Kafka topic, and so on. We can see here uh, more information about the deployment, and the same works for the models that were a result of the different experiments. We can go to experiments and see that we just uh, launched one experiment, but we can find the, the logs of this experiment in this uh, folder, for example, in the a file system, or we can directly navigate to the model that was generated uh, out of this experiment. And I think it's, this is pretty much all that I wanted to show. Uh, it's a pity that there was a typo, I think, in the, the name of the topic. But uh, yeah, overall, this is what I wanted to show. And how can we how we can uh, perform end to end um, uh, develop end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning projects using the cave serving and the, the feature store. So now I will stop sharing uh, my screen. I see we have here one question. Let's see, uh, Jim is already answering it. I will stop sharing here, okay. Is there... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can say it's, it's just it's a, really the answer. question was, is there any way of, of um, automatic creation of online, offline feature store in a few lines of code by only looking at my model input features? I mean, I think, so first, I think there's a, we, we have different terminology in here. We have um, a feature group and we have train data sets. So feature store itself is one line of code to create it. Um, and uh, the feature group is, yeah. is, is still, it's a couple of lines of code great one. Um, basically, when you write a data frame to a feature group, it's synced to both online and offline. The only uh, limitation right now is that the structured streaming API that writes uh, to the online feature store, um, you do have to write separately to the offline feature store, but we will be updating that in, the, in an upcoming version. Um, all right, I think we're done. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Javier. Uh, we're over time, so we won't be able to take any more questions today. But just a reminder that you will receive the slides and the, and the video recording later. And you can try Hopsworks for free. Uh, we have sent a link here in the chat. Uh, we offer $4,000 worth of COP credits for you to try it out. All the notebooks are available on GitHub as well. So feel free to take a look and Stay tuned. We're going to have more events coming up in the next few months. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day or evening, depending where you are. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Gianluigi. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. Have a great one. Have a great summer. Mm -hmm.